Good evening. Oops, that's not on. Is it? it is on. Good evening, everybody. Um, we have a, we have special guests here tonight, and probably some of the state's foremost experts on nuclear power and what's happening in our future. Uh, I do want to tell you first, by the way, that uh, President Satcamp and Provost Carr will be here. We have a program graduating tonight over at the college, and they just said, you know, the academics just have to come first. Uh, but they will be here shortly, as soon as they can get here. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, we have a couple of people to thank for putting this together. As frequently happens with the Hughes Lecture Series, we can thank the good Senator Gormley for bringing guests down here for us. And then we're always pleased to have a very special person here and his wife, it's Ambassador and Mrs. Hughes, um, who give much time, energy, and everything you can think of to the Hughes Center. So thank you so much, including your name. <laughs> and there are a few Hughes Center board members here, if you would. I see, um, I see Noah Bronkesh, I see Ed Salmon, who's the chair. Um, that's what, oh, oh, Mike Tuasto back there from PS. Thank you all for being here. Uh, and I see one of our board of trustees is here, Barbara Morbay. Thank you for being here. And thank the rest of you for being here also. Um, I'm not going to read you the, the bios of the people. I can only tell you that we have... We have Bill Levis, who's probably one of, the, one of the state's authorities on nuclear and how we're going to bring it in or what's going to happen in New Jersey, if it happens at all. Is that correct, Bill? Well, it'll happen. Yeah, it'll yeah. happen, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mike, that's not what you told me before you got here. Uh, <laughs> uh, and of course, we have, we have Governor Christie, please come in, uh, Governor Christine Top Whitman here who also is the co-chair of the um, Clean and Safe Energy Coalition on a national level. And has, I've heard her speak at National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners on this topic. And she is also an authority on what is happening in the nuclear industry here in the country. And then we're fortunate enough to have, have Ed Rogers here from, um, from NJN. And, and he is an environmental expert on, in everything. Is that right? <laughs> 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 At least that's what he's told us in the past. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Ed and see if we can have some small discussion, and then we'll ask you for your Q&A as we go along. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sharon. It's great to be here. NJN and I have a strong connection with Stockton. We have a bureau uh, on the campus and report down here. And one of my first jobs with NJM back in early 1986 was to come down here to be the South Jersey assignment editor. Uh, and we were stationed in the, uh, I guess it was called the Scott House, right on Jimmy Leeds Road. So that goes, goes back a long, I have a long history and a long connection with Stockton, and it's great to be here. So let me, let me just start the discussion with a, a question based on some of the things we've been reading and seeing in the news ask this of Governor Whitman first. As we know, President Obama has called for building more nuclear reactors uh, to help our energy needs in the future. But several states so far haven't embraced the idea. In, in Vermont, uh, the Senate there voted to close the 24-year-old Vermont Yankee plant. Mm -hmm. Earlier this month, New York State denied a permit to Indian Point for its water intake system. In the final days of the Corzine administration, the DEP uh, decided in its draft permit to require the operators of Oyster Creek to build a cooling tower. And in Florida, uh, there's the future of, I guess, the two new reactors in there is in doubt because of cost. While there have been polls out that show, uh, I guess, 60% of those polls 63. Mm -hmm. you know, support the idea of nuclear being part of the portfolio, mm -hmm. there seems to be some apprehension, some anxiety in the states. How, how would you address that? Sure. Well, first of all, that, that's true. I mean, the latest, the Gallup poll showed 63% uh, approval or support for nuclear as being part of the portfolio. And I think the most important thing is to emphasize that part of. I don't think there's any utility that would say, let's go all nuclear, that's going to solve our problems. It should be part, though, of what we look at when we look at the whole basket of possible energy suppliers as far as base power is concerned. It's not the answer for every place. South Carolina has taken some very aggressive steps to help 
and cost recovery up front to make it possible to have nuclear in South Carolina. Florida is moving forward. I mean, we actually have a house looking across at Turkey Point, which is the, where they're talking about putting in another reactor, and I'm all for it. I would like to see it there. But I do co-chair Case Energy, which is a, that's a grassroots organization. CleanSafeEnergy.org is the, is the website. And we've got some 2,500, more than 2,500 organizations and individuals as members. And the point there is to get information out to people so they can make an informed decision. Again, based on the premise that nuclear is not a silver bullet, it's not the answer for everyone, but people can't make a good decision about whether or not they want nuclear without facts. And you don't get the facts from The Simpsons, which is, this generation is where they get most of them, because I don't know who it is. I don't watch them. I don't know whether it's Bart or somebody works at a nuclear plant and glows at night or something like that. So <laughs> it's not the best way to get your information. And what we're trying to do is, is get information out, because while there is a a very legitimate concern, some very legitimate questions to be asked. I think there's some very, very good, I know there are very good answers to respond to that, to allow people to understand what do we want. We're better than 50% nuclear in this state. To me, what is uh, very attractive about that is the amount of N NOx that's uh, nitrogen oxide that's avoided each year because of our nuclear power today, every year, is the equivalent of what would be put out by 2.5 million cars. We have, if that's as if we added another 2.5 million cars to our road on top of the 3.8 million we have today. That's helping to clean our air. And we have cleaner air today, as we just saw in the latest studies that came out yesterday. We are cleaning our air gradually. It's not where we want it to be. But, and that's why I co-chair case with Dr. Patrick Moore, who is one of the co-founders of Greenpeace. And we really came to it wanting to get the information out because of the environmental benefits that Nuclear is the only form of base power that releases no greenhouse gases or regulated air pollutants while it's producing power. And when people get that information, then they start to get more comfortable with it. The people who live closest to the reactors are actually the ones that are even more overwhelmingly in favor of bringing new power online. And I think you'll, you'll see changes, but it's not going to be the answer for everybody. A uh, little later, I want to ask you a follow-up question on that. Uh on the carbon question sure. that you're bringing up. But let me talk to Bill here for a second. The cost of building one of the new design reactors out there, it's from five to $10 billion, is that an accurate? Uh, well, I'll tell you the answer that I tell my <laughs> chief financial officer is I don't know right now. And I say that because you will see different numbers and they're presented different ways. And is that the overnight cost? Is that the cost with or without financing? Does that include all the owner's costs? And there's a whole you know, series of questions you get associated. But the more important thing is we will know when we build the first couple. And we provide a little more certainty to the process. And then uh, we haven't built a new plant here for a number of years. And uh, there will be some learnings associated with, uh, with when we do that for the first time again. That said, there's over 50 plants being built overseas now. There are people that will come there and help us do that. The manufacturers involved in doing that are doing it much differently today than they were decades ago. We can uh, basically guarantee the cost of 60% of that plant up front now where we couldn't before. Essentially the design before was like how people would build their homes, stick build, design as you go. And uh, that's a very expensive process. So with a standardized design, modular construction, there will be more certainty in cost going forward. But that certain, further certainty will be gained uh, when we actually do it here in this country. You talked about 60% of the cost up front. Is that from federal loans? Because we've also heard that Wall Street hasn't really signed on to the idea of nuclear. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. Essentially, you can fix price the 60% of the cost of the plant up front. It's known with respect to the, the materials that you're going to need to do it and the engineering that already be accomplished. That leaves essentially 40% of it still of a variable that, uh, that will need to be managed during the course of construction. Okay. One of the things you hear from opponents of expanding nuclear power is the cost for insurance. Is that factored in? It will be factored in our costs when we go to build. And, and I think one of the misconceptions out there is that uh, we, is this, these are insurance or subsidy costs, and in fact, they are not. The loan guarantee program, as it is designed, is basically the cost of that is borne by the people who subscribe to the program. So the, we pay a fee up front you know, you know, related to how it, the, the risk, financial risk is scored by, by, the, uh, by the Office of Management and Budget. So 
that, that peak is, is, is you know, anywhere, from, we think about 1% of the total amount that will be guaranteed, but that, that cost is borne by those who subscribe to the program. What, for PSE&G, the portfolio, what part is nuclear in New Jersey? Uh, that, let's see, there's, there's two ways to answer that question. One is from an overall capacity standpoint, and that is if you looked at the total generation mix, what is available from all, from all our generating assets, which would include coal, gas, oil, and even a pump storage facility. And that, that total is in New Jersey is about 13,000 megawatts total. Of that total, 3,700 is nuclear. So you'd say on a percentage basis, what is available to run, about 30% of that is nuclear. However, what actually runs is based on cost, because a low-cost unit goes first. Is, uh, our nuclear units are the lowest cost units in the state, and as a result, and, and the governor referred to this before, over 50% of the power in uh, New Jersey come from uh, the nuclear plants. You say it's the lowest cost energy in the portfolio. Does that include solar? And per kilowatt. Okay. Absolutely, per kilowatt it does. Today, absolutely. Yes. Solar is actually on the far end of the scale, mm -hmm. on the expensive and side. And wind as well. Okay. Well, that, that kind of segues into my next question, other costs associated with nuclear. One of the things you'll hear opponents say, well, do they factor in the cost of uh, the fuel rods, the waste okay. product? Mm -hmm. Is that? Well, I, I can tell you some <coughs> costs that are advertising. And you, you hear a number, $6,000 a kilowatt, typically talked about for a cost of a new nuclear plant. And, and folks will they'll talk about similar numbers for wind and solar. Now, there are some things you need to understand the second part of that. That $6,000 per kilowatt is for a plant that operates at greater than 90% of the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, versus a $6,000 per kilowatt hour energy source that has a capacity factor of 20% and operates perhaps only at night or during the day. So if you were to actually scale that up to where there are equivalent amounts of energy being provided, you'd see the costs separate much more than that. One of the, uh, the, the issue I brought up and the environmental issue. Some people say, well, we're, we're talking about nuclear as a choice uh, <coughs> in dealing with global warming. It's a uh, low carbon or carbon free mm -hmm. energy choice. Um, yet they say there are factors, some of the things we talked about, which, um, you know, the nuclear waste problem. How? how I understand that places like Japan and France, they've dealt with the issue of recycling mm -hmm. some of that waste. How far away are we from having anything in place like that in this country? Well, we haven't done it. Uh, you know, we got out of the nuclear business in the 70s. But first of all, when, and I get that question a lot, it's a very real question and an understandable one. If you took all of the spent rods we have today in this country from the 104 reactors, they would full, fill up one football field to the height of the goalposts. That's what you're talking about. It's not something the size of the state of Maine, which people often think about. Now, in those spent rods, and correct me if I'm wrong, they're between 96 and 97 percent fissionable material left there. I mean, real energy that can be reused or reprocessed. And that's what they've been doing in France, and that's what they've been doing now in Japan. France used to reprocess all the Japanese waste. And the Japanese figured they could make money, and so they've, they're doing it themselves now. But we uh, have not done it. They've done it. In France, they house the waste underneath the, what's left. They get that down, let me finish that thought. They get that down to 2 3% fissionable material. Now, that's highly enriched plutonium at the end of the process, but the Japanese, as I understand, are the ones who have figured out in their reprocessing how to ensure that, that what's left in the waste is no way weapons grade, could never be used as, as weapons grade, which is something that concerns people, obviously, and, and it should. So we're talking about a much smaller amount that needs to be dealt with. I mean, right now, the rods are safely stored either in underwater holding ponds or above ground reinforced concrete bunkers on site. But the question is, is it, do we, are we comfortable with having 104 different sites around the country? The Congress has said no. Congress said there needs to be one national repository, and they named Yucca Mountain. And as long as Harry Reid is president of the Senate, we're not going to have Yucca Mountain. But that may not happen. Um, he's in a tough reelect fight. But even if he is reelected, I think there's going to come a time when the rest of the country is going to say, look, if we really want to have this as part of our power going forward, we can't let Yucca Mountain go. And as you saw, Secretary Chu has already stopped the decommissioning process that was, they were going, undergoing for Yucca Mountain. 
And so we've spent a lot of money. As taxpayers, we put a lot of money into Yucca. And uh, it is a safe repository that can be expanded even. Congress put a limit on how big it could be. But I, while the rods, it's a serious question to ask, and it's a real question to ask. It's not one that should be a uh, showstopper. And Chu and in the President's budget, they have put money in for increasing the research and development on reprocessing to get it going in this country. And that's one of the other really attractive things of, to me about nuclear is the number of jobs and the kinds of jobs you could get and reprocessing. These are things we used to do. We were leading technology, nuclear technology, back in the 70s when we were doing it. And then we stopped. And now we're falling behind everybody else in the world who is going ahead with nuclear. And we can get it back again. We can be back on top. Again, not the answer for everything. It's got to be done in, along with uh, conservation, which I think is A number one of what we need to do, as well as um, renewables. Even though getting these plants in place, you're looking at a time frame 10 to 20 years before some of these new designs could be built and operational, shouldn't they solve and even it with the, the uh, recycling process, there's still some ways to left. Shouldn't they solve that issue before we start building new plants? Well, let me uh, try to answer. I, the fact is the issue exists today, and it's not just the commercial sector that has, you know, spent fuel. The Navy's, you know, got the, been in the nuclear business for 40 years also, and, uh, you know, there's a responsibility, quite frankly, that the government has to be able to deal with that responsibly. That waste exists today. And uh, to, to say we won't generate any more until that problem is solved, it's, it's, first of all, we generate more every day. And uh, I don't know that we can just say stop until, we, in, until we, we come to the next step. The fact of the matter is that there are solutions here. We had a solution in this country. We stop with that. And uh, we just need to decide what it is and, and, and get on with it. Well, I, let me just add one other thing, too, and, and correct me on the, on the cost that you mentioned. Um, I was talking, I did a, a panel back with T. Boone Pickens when he was still talking about his wind farm. And the average nuclear reactor, first of all, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has made some changes. So I don't think we're looking at, what, 8 to 10 years <coughs> from the time you first go in, hopefully, to turning the that key, process, not 20 we'll, years. That process will get better. And obviously, the yeah. new process, there will be some bumps in the road as we work our way through that. But I, you know, I, I believe it will be less than 10. But the fact of the matter is, any source of generation you want to go permit, you know, offshore wind, eight years to permit right now, just to permit. And then I'm not sure how many years to construct after that. So there is no simple thing that will get built tomorrow, whether it's transmission lines, a gas plant, a coal plant. They all take significant time to permit. And then the other side of that on the permitting on something like the wind farm back, as I say, we're talking with, with Mr. Pickens, that wind farm, which would have generated the same amount of power as an average nuclear reactor, took over 200,000 acres. A nuclear reactor requires about a square mile, and a lot of that is buffer. And so just acquiring that land, setting it aside, um, it's a huge, that's a huge expense too, and time consuming. So I mean, there are just no easy answers. The problem is we're going to need wind, it, and we're going to have to learn how to store those renewables. We're going to need solar power, but it's not economically viable yet. We're going to need a mix of power. Coal will always be there, better than 50% of our power today. You mentioned. Uh Nuclear is a base load. Mm -hmm. Wind is advertised as a base load, too, by some. Um, the other the thing about nuclear, it's a centralized power source. What we're beginning to see and what some people are talking about, you know, this, this idea of, and you, you mentioned the, the cost with solar is um, hypothetically a, a community of 200 people who get their energy from uh, a solar facility. Let's say it's uh, two megawatts, costs $10 million to build, uh, 10 acres. They get it built in five years, maybe less, no, maybe a few years. And they get their power from that. This community decides to build it, and they're getting their power for that. They pay a fee <laughs> to the utility for use of the grid, the, 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 the lines that come into their home. Um, why, at, at some point, even if it's through federal loans, should they pay for nuclear power? And, and when 
they, let's say they're able to store some of the power and that they get you know, the power they might need from offshore wind. If you have that scenario, why, why should citizens buy in? People who, you know, or I guess they call it, uh, part of it's, I don't want to call it net grid metering, but, uh, you know, these small community solar projects. Why, if I'm doing the right things, and I, I have an energy audit, uh, I've taken the steps to, to lower my cost. We're talking about <coughs> nuclear power plants that cost uh, five to ten billion dollars. We have the waste issue. Uh, we have the fish kill issue. You also have an issue with uh, security. Why should my tax dollars pay for federal loans to get nuclear power plants built? Well, I guess I'll try to answer it in one way. One is I'll try to say tax dollars aren't paying for federal loans. In fact, that loan program is paid for by the subscribers. Now, <laughs> relative to the first question, and you will hear our company talk about we should do conservation, you should do renewables where it makes sense, and that what we shouldn't do is mandate solutions that where one size fits all. Um, solar is great in some applications, in some locations. It just so happens New Jersey, although we have you know, the second most amount in the country, is really not the best location for solar because of the capacity factor that we'll see there relative to other parts of the country. New Jersey is not a good place for wind, except for offshore. So, uh, you know, and there are other parts of the country much better suited for that. So what you hear us talk about is get the right solution for the area that you're in. For a small community where the power needs aren't all that great, that, that you know, have a, the availability of those sorts of sources, they should take advantage of them where they can. But they should also recognize that they, they, you know, what the cost, the true cost of those uh, really are. And then it comes down to the 24-7. The availability of the power. You need to have power that's reliable, affordable, <clears throat> and constant. And that's what you get with the base power. So if you look at it, we're going to, according to the Department of Energy, there is going to be a 23% increase in demand for electricity by 2030. That's only 20 years away. That's not that far away. The renewable portfolio is about 2.5% of our energy today if you take out hydropower, and hydro is almost fully built out in this country right now. There's not much more room for, for hydro. So if you talk about doubling or tripling the renewables, which we should be trying to do, you're still not going to get to that point to meet that need. And again, we still have the issue of being able to store that power. And I must say I haven't heard of wind being called a, a base power because, again, no. it's particularly here. It's one of the things that they're working with now um, on trying. It's interesting. They're saying one of the things we have to have in order to really be able to rely on wind power is much better climatology and our weathermen can no longer be 50 percent right or wrong. It's got to be if you're really going to rely on this power you have got to have a much better idea of the wind and of course you know if you're if, with barriers and concerns there are barriers and concerns to wind there even amongst environmentalists. So there are pros and cons for every form of power and as Bill said it, it's what's right for where you are and what your mix should be but at the end of the day we're going to want part of that is going to be have to be that safe, reliable, affordable power and, and power that's always there, always on 24-7 the way our lives are. Particularly if we move, I, I hear a lot of people talking all the time about how great it will be when we have electric cars and that will be fine as far as emissions because mobile sources are a large part of our problem. But they're only going to be as good as the power used to produce the electricity to run the cars and then when I talk to people who say, you know, well, it's not going to be a problem on the grid because everybody will plug in at night when you're not using the power for other things. And I have two problems with that. One, I've never known the American people all to do the same thing at the same time, no matter what. And we do have time zones and, and people like to drive at night. So there's that problem, too. There's going to be a strain on the grid. But that doesn't mean you say no to any one of those. It just means that you're going to have to understand that there will always be a mix needed. We actually have some direct experience operating plants in Texas where there's a lot of wind. And uh, there have been occasions where the wind has just gone away. And uh, that, of course, creates challenges to the grid. But things that renewable energy sources can't provide are what we call ancillary services, and that essentially is frequency and voltage control. 
You know, you know, a lot of manufacturers don't like frequency and voltage to vary because it can it can actually harm the the, the process equipment that they use and. Uh, uh, the, the renewable energy sources can't provide that, nor can they accurately match supply and demand, which changes all the time. So a number of our plants cycle up and down in power to, to exactly match the load all the time, and renewables are on or they're off. And uh, you need some power plant backing them up to be able to, to, to take up or, or, or let down as, as those come on and off. Somewhat. One of the advantages of offshore wind, though, that it's a more constant source because of its location. Uh, more constant, yes. I think capacity factor numbers you still advertise are about 40 percent, but uh, those will still yet to be proven as, as we build that out. One of the other issues uh, in, I guess, five states that I've seen is uh, we've, we've had a number of cases of tritium leaks. Mm -hmm. Some have affected groundwater, some haven't. Um, and I, I guess this is with our some of our older reactors. Um, will the new, the, the new designed reactors deal with that problem? We certainly learn every day better ways to operate our plants, and uh, we shouldn't have leaks of uh, you know tritium, uh, you know you know to the ground. And uh, new designs will make sure we factor in the, those possibilities greater. But I would tell you that the tritium issue is more one of public confidence than it is of public health. And uh, that said, uh, the, the leaks that we're talking about really aren't a, a problem from a technical standpoint, but it does question, uh, you know, the, 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 the competence of the folks who operate the plants and, you know, why can't you prevent that sort of thing? If you can't prevent that, out, what else is going on? And so I would say we have not done as good a job as we can in dealing with that issue in, in, in the public, explaining what it really is and what it is we're doing to correct it. I think another thing, too, that's going to have a big impact on nuclear is the new generation, because of the 104 reactors we have today in the country, what, 95 use a different technology? Somewhere in there in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So there was no um, learning curve that the NRC went up or anybody else. And you train people on one reactor, even within your own utility, you might not be able to move them to another one because it wasn't the same kind of reactor. Now there are five, I guess, that uh, are In, in the really, mill for design certification. Yeah, in the design certification. That's probably all they'll be. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission will never pick a winner. They'll never say, we're only going to use GE or we're only going to license this one or that one. But it, it'll come down to five because the industry learned, too, that, that it was costing them a lot of money to have a new type of reactor every time they built one to do it all over again and, and learn. And so that's going to help greatly, I think, in ensuring that they put in the proper safeguards to protect the public and ensure that we continue to have a, a safe history with nuclear. I think somewhat what's interesting, Ed, is the fact that we can even have this conversation today. Uh, you know, I've been in this business 30-some years, and I will tell you, 15 years ago, I wasn't sure we could ever have this kind of conversation if there was a future for nuclear in our country. And uh, I would like to say that we were great operators of nuclear plants right out of the gates, but we were not. And it, it took us a number of years to become good operators. And, and in fact, it's just with, I would say, the last 10 to 15 years that we've really started to operate these plants the way they were designed to operate. And uh, with that, good operation of, of the plants gives us the chance to be able to talk about new ones. But it's the reminder we have for our folks every day is there will be no new plants unless uh, we operate the ones we have today, you know, with excellence. Okay. Well, I think I've covered everything I'd like to cover. Are there any questions from the audience? Would you like to make a comment? It's interesting. My name is Alfonso Gandica. I'm a retiree from Atlantic City Electric Company and an adjunct professor at Stockton. <coughs> I teach a course, uh, it's an oxymoron called Energy and Ethics. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think it's an oxymoron. <laughs> but anyhow, one of the things that amazes me is that we dropped the first two nuclear bombs, we developed the technology, but yet France generates about 78% less year of it's electricity using nuclear. All the plants are standardized. The highest ambition of a highly educated French girl or boy when they get away from college is to go and work for electricity in France. Why don't we do it? I mean, do they know better than we do? 
Well, I would tell you, like I would tell you, I tell you, we did do that on the on the Navy side. There are 104 operating yeah. nuclear plants on the Navy side also oh. that have a standard design that went from one generation to the next, much like the French did. But uh, I think the other important part is the French government subsidizes EDF, Areva, and all the other major players there. Unlike you know how business is conducted in, in, in our country. And it's interesting, you know, you mentioned the loans and. I think it's important to make that distinction that what the industry is looking for is the loan guarantee program. It's not money up front. It's a guarantee. It's a backstop. And that's really to make, it, make money available on the private side. It's to give the banks some confidence that they can lend the money and hopefully get the cost down of, of that money. But we have this entrepreneurial spirit in our country where we all, we all think yeah. we're smarter than the guy next yeah. to us. Especially the so, French. Yeah, so, <laughs> so trying to get this standardized uh, design is, uh, is actually it's, it's important and necessary work, and uh, I think we'll be much better at it uh, this next year. Well, the other thing we have to realize is it's not just the environment. But when you look at it, in the last decade, the largest transfer of wealth to the Middle Eastern oil-producing countries came from us, $10 trillion. You know how many schools that builds? You know how much health insurance that pays? Well, there was, in fact, a transfer of technology to the Japanese and, and French of our designs. Yeah. The, this, this, so they took our designs, advanced them a generation, developed the manufacturing expertise, and unfortunately, we're in a position now where we have to buy it back. Mm -hmm. And we're actually buying the parts back today. So the replacement steam generators that we got from our sound plant, they came from France. The reactor heads that we replaced at our sound plant, they came from France. And, well, isn't uh, it true that there's only one, one factory in Japan that makes uh, that casts the, the steel for that central? That, that's correct. Right now, just, I think, one in Japan, the second being developed, and China's working on four right now to be able to make the large parts for reactor vessels. Which are jobs, I mean, I put on my governor's hat, former governor's hat, and, say, and I look at it and I say, those are jobs we can bring back here. I mean, they're... If you start manufacturing again, we can manufacture those parts. We did it. And just for a nuclear reactor, during construction, depending on the size and how many reactors you put in, you could have up to 2,400 jobs. But once a reactor is up and running, it's between five and 700 permanent full-time jobs that pay about 30% more than the average. They, they throw off some $430 million a year in economic benefits to the local community and $40 million in, in uh, wages and benefits. So there's a lot to be said. That's not, to my mind, that's never why you should say you want to have nuclear. It shouldn't be just about the jobs, but it is a very nice uh, add-on if you decide you're going to go nuclear. Could you comment on the, on the security issue? Because I, we, we hear media stories about terrorists and homeland security. Can you, can you help give us some facts on that? Because I think I think that gets distorted a lot of the time. Well, I'll, I'll well, back you up. Well, the, the expert, but I'll well folks, <laughs> if anybody's got a question about security, come visit us. Yeah. I don't know any better way to ba basically demonstrate what it is we do than come look at what we do from a security standpoint. And you will walk away from this plant not worried a bit about, about the plant being attacked. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of the number. Since 9-11, and remember, before 9-11, we had security at our plants. We had an approved security plan from the NRC that, that involved, uh, you know, a, a number, of, you know, from you know, enhanced uh, search, uh, fitness for duty, and all these sorts of programs well before 9-11. But since that period of time, at our plants alone, $100 million we've invested. The NRC takes security, and the industry takes security enormously seriously because they know what damage would occur should any breach happen. And they do models of even diving a fully loaded plane into a nuclear reactor, and you don't get a mushroom cloud. I mean, people also think of what's in these rods as being a gaseous type of material that's going to come leaking out and, and affect everybody. It's not. They're pellets. Now, they're, you don't want to go anywhere near them if there's a breach. On, uh, don't get me wrong, on the rod, you're not going to get very far, which is why they're not a terribly attractive terrorist target. But even if you drove a plane into them, you're not going to, it's not going to be good for anybody right there, but it's not going to cover the whole state the way people kind of think of in their minds. So they're running, and they run, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but the NRC does non-announced, uh, basically, infiltration attempts. 
at the utilities. They don't tell them when they're coming, and they try to actually get in. Yeah, we, we actually, honestly, we, we do know when the drills are going to be they're, cause, they because they're terribly complex to, 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 to pull off, and, and there's you know tremendous safeguards you have to put in place to make sure that somebody doesn't shoot somebody for real. <laughs> because if somebody tried to Makes get sense. in and didn't know it was a drill, they'd shoot them. Absolutely. I mean, you know, <laughs> folks understand the deadly force requirements and they'll exercise it. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we have pretty strong relationships with, uh, you know, the Office of Homeland Security, both the federal and the state. And I will tell you, I'm part of the committee there, and they're not worried about our nuclear plants in the state of New Jersey. I won't tell you what it is they're worried about, but it's not, not where we are in the South. Chemical. Back there. My question is about the production of nuclear fuel, especially in comparison with reduction of coal. As you know, much of West Virginia seems to be ripped open these days for mountaintop removal of coal, and the same is happening in the western states. Um, if nuclear was scaled up to the level of coal, how much damage would be done by the production of nuclear fuel? And also, um, is there enough nuclear fuel, and where does it come from? And is the process of producing nuclear fuel um, being hidden as a way of generating huge amounts of carbon dioxide. I just don't know anything about those. Are you parts. talking about uranium mining? I'm talking about uranium, yes. Or um, plutonium. I, I will tell you, I, I'm not an expert on uranium mining, so I, I, I don't have a good answer uh, to that, uh, that part of the question. Uh, uranium comes from uh, a number of places in the world. There's some in the United States. Predominantly, it comes from Australia, Canada, and Kazakhstan. Those are the, the big sources of uranium at this point. Uh, once you get the uranium, there are several processes you have to go through to get actually where it's workable as a fuel. It has to be uh, converted and then it has to be enriched. And so there are facilities uh, throughout the world and some in the United States where those sorts of things are done. How much CO2 is generated in that process, I can't tell you, but I will tell you as part of our early site permit application, it is actually something we have to address in the fuel manufacturing process. What is the the, the, the carbon associated with that when you address the whole CO2 issue. So it, would, it was something that will be available. In fact, where's Dave Lewis? I thought I saw him tonight. Do you know the number, Dave? Uh, it's about 5% of the total compared to energy. It is 5% of the, uh, when you compare a nuclear plant to a coal plant, you have about 45% total CO2. So, and the, the mining question, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, I don't know enough about how that's done. Can we go back to Yucca Mountain a minute? <laughs> Getting the split rise up to Yucca Mountain, what is the security issues for that? What is the risk of accident? Well, we move nuclear around this country every single day. I don't think people realize it. Um, I know Bill wasn't going to say it, but I will tell you where the biggest risk is. It's chemical. Chemical site security and chemical trucks moving chemicals around this country. That's where we've seen the big problems when you have a chemical spill, a tanker. Um, it is moved very safely. Now, I don't know how far you want to get into the kind of precautions that are put in place, mm -hmm. but uh, there are enormous uh, precautions put in place, and you would have to move more fuel, but it is moving every day around the country. Yeah, yeah come on. I don't know who's, if anyone has been there, but I would tell you, if you can't put fuel there, you can't put it anywhere. Yeah. I mean, really, right Middle next to Yucca Mountain is the above-ground nuclear weapons test site where we did above-ground testing of nuclear weapons. And there's still areas significantly contaminated out there from that. Yucca Mountain's a, 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 more a hill than a mountain. Uh, there's a hole in the middle with 1,000 foot of granite above, 1,000 foot of granite below, where they're actually doing experiments to see if water ever existed. So some of the accounts you read, they're a little overblown about you know, the water and whatnot out there. In fact, when you go out there, it's about 90 miles north of Las Vegas. You have to drink water so for the fear you'll be dehydrated when you're there. And by the way, the other side of it is Death Valley. But the moving of it is not, is not something that, again, that, that people... The military's should, been doing it for they decades. They do it all the time. Medical I, waste, medical. Yeah, and uh, we can move this stuff safely in, 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 the, in the cast that the governor described before that uh, have all sorts of safeguards built into them. Man, this is not an issue of can we do it. This is do we have the will to do it. The uh, recycling of the spent fuel rods. Is it just been a, a problem with there's been no demand for it in the country because there have been well, it's, it's no interesting. plans? Well, yeah, the gentleman asked the question about how much uranium is. The reason we were going to get into the recycling business in the 70s is there was fear there would not be enough uranium. Okay. And we wanted to make sure there was a viable supply going forward, so we're going to reprocess and, and basically have a, a continuing supply of uh, uranium. 
the economics of that changed, and so the economics forced these processes essentially, you know, away from our strategy in the 70s. Uh, but there are technologies out there to reprocess a, port of it, a portion of this, which is what actually France and Japan does, and there's you know, other processes where you can essentially, re you know, basically recycle the fuel. What was different there? Why was it adopted there? You, you mentioned the economics. I'm just wondering specifically why those two countries decided well, to get into that business. What's different about France and Japan is uh, we are blessed in our country with an abundance of natural resources. They are not. And so the expression in France is no gas, no coal, no oil, no choice. And it's not much different in Japan from that. And uh, so they don't have some of the options that we do with coal and, and gas and the like. And so they adopted early on, knew that nuclear had to be a part of their solution. And frankly, you see the country of India doing the same thing right now. And so as part of their build-out process, they're building with it uh, you know, recycling capability of fuel, not just reprocessing, but recycling. There'll be quantum leaps, I think, uh, ahead in the technology development because not only do you have France and, and uh, Japan and China getting into it, Almost all, even England, which was decommissioning its uh, all of its nuclear reactors, is taking a second look at that as the North, Shore, North Sea oil starts to run out. Germany, which always said no way, no how. Angela Merkel is talking about it, mostly because they're signatories to the Kyoto Protocol, and they're having a very hard time meeting their budgets, uh, meeting their targets under the Kyoto Protocol. And so one of the ways they're looking at, at trying to meet those air emission requirements, because the next round if they ever get to a next round, uh, will have actual legal implications behind it. Uh, it. It leaves them with no choice, really, but to go for, for nuclear if they're going to continue to grow their economies with a, a sustainable source of power. Bill, you had a question? Any observations regarding the cooling power debate? I, I could share a couple of things with you, and, and I'll speak uh, from Sam Hoprick. One is it was interesting to me when uh, we went overseas to look at uh, new nuclear plants being built, um, went and visited Finland, uh, France, and Japan, where there were three plants under construction all on the coast. None of them had cooling towers. So we asked them, so this gets to the cost issue again. How much does it cost? It's another one of these little differences. So I said, well, why don't you have cooling towers here? And their answer to me was, why would you have cooling towers there? The only place we would use cooling towers is if there's a limited makeup water source. And then we put one in. Uh, that said, uh, we have been studying the estuary where our plants are located for decades. And we have, a, I'd say, significant data showing that the actual impact of uh, our once-through cooling system really is minimal. And in fact, is more than made up with uh, we have an estuary enhancement program where we've stored uh, acres and acres of, of, of wetlands and marshland and the like. And that the fish populations that are in question, we can show they've been actually increased in numbers over the years at the juvenile stage. Now, fishermen may say, hey, those big ones aren't here anymore. Well, the big ones aren't the ones that we're harming because they're strong enough to swim away. But the actual fish, you know, of, of the folks talk about a concern, we can actually show that that population's increased since the plant's been there. Actually, that's the best fishing around Oyster uh, Turkey Point. It's the best fishing in the Keys down there. Now, now are, there real, the are there real Keys. issues? I'm sorry, are there real issues with some of those waterways? Absolutely. You know what the biggest contributor to that is? Fertilizer. In the, in the, in the build-out of homes and businesses and runoff and whatnot. And frankly, I, we, we see the more stuff in the river today. It's the Garden State now. <laughs> yeah, we, we do see more stuff getting washed in the river, and, uh, and, and uh, we frankly deal with that sort of stuff with our, our traveling streams. So that, that, that has actually, the fertilizer has had, in your opinion, a greater impact. That's correct. Oh, yeah. Congressman? Yeah. Yeah. One of the other countries went about storage. I mean, the pre-sited facilities in our country never intended, in most instances, for on-site storage of spent fuel. Uh, and frankly, we're storing a lot now on-site. So what, what, is, what are the arguments about on-site versus centralized? Because you come out and for now is, is a you know, pretty growing issue. So what, what, what are the trade-offs involved in on-site? Story to spent fuel versus basically centralized. And the second part of the question is can we, can we attract the guarantees that we need and financing is needed to build plans and do the same without solving that problem? 
those are some great questions, and those, it's a part of the reason why we're going slowly and not rapidly through the new plant process. Uh, I'll, I'll try on the first one here. First of all, I would say we can safely store fuel on our site for a long time. The, the real question is why would we want to? If, in fact, 96% of the energy is still available in those fuel rods there, wouldn't we like to have a facility perhaps at some point that we could use to get that other energy out? And it, wouldn't it be better if rather than having fuel stored at, uh, you know, the 60-some sites in the country, we had it at a central spot? For reprocessing. For, for reprocessing time, or just for, you know, safekeeping. You know, uh, not that we can't safely do it at our places, but uh, wouldn't it be better in, in one place uh, than, than another? Uh, frankly, it's land we could use to build another plant. Uh, but uh, this comes down to... Uh, and it's interesting. So we store the stuff on site, but we had a sue. We sued the federal government to get the money to help build it. So right now, with the, the various uh, lawsuits, we're tying up a, a lot of legal folks. Uh, you know, basically trying to get the government to meet their obligation. You know, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act was passed in 1982. That said, the government would find the solution for this. Came up with a solution for it. Said they would take fuel by 1998. That did not happen. And so I think what it does is it creates doubts in the public's mind then, hey, well, was there something wrong with this? Why can't we solve this? Is this really a problem? You know, we're, we're, we're smart and clever folks. Why haven't we come up with a solution to this? And it creates doubt. And with that doubt raises the question of should we do more then? So, you know, technically, can, can we advance new nuclear plants without uh, a solution to this? Yes. It makes the conversation a lot easier if we have a solution, though. Bill, you mentioned the cooling tower issue mm -hmm. um, with plants, the two plants. I, I just wondered, um, the, the, you say you've dealt with the uh, marine life issue. There's still weather issues with those systems as opposed to cooling towers. I think I remember, I think it was back in 94, I think, a newer governor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. the, the, there was, uh, I guess, an alert at Salem because I guess this, there was a, a problem with too much river grass mm -hmm. that had entered the system, and I believe this past winter, because of river ice, some of the intakes had were affected. No, it's a, it, there, you know, river grass can clog up these screens, and what it does, it'll prevent then water to go through the condenser, which cools the turbine, and if the turbine's not available, the reactor part will automatically shut down. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not a safety concern as much as it is one of production, mm -hmm. and obviously we lose that generation uh, during that period of time. Uh, like we don't like to challenge our plants, and, and we want them on all the time too. So we have actually advanced uh, and improved those screens significantly since 1994, uh, looking at uh, new designs all the time. And we have actually three different screens actually in service here now, trying to determine which one is the best for dealing with that particular issue. But uh, another point I think that's important to make on cooling tires, and the governor referred to this before, there's trade-offs with everything. It, it, we were to put cooling tires in at Salem, it reduces the efficiency of the plant. And in fact, it would reduce the output by about 80 megawatts. Now, where does that 80 megawatts come from now if it doesn't come from that plant? Recognizing the total solar in the state of New Jersey is just over 100 megawatts right now. So that simple, you know, if they put them in, 80 megawatts we've got to find from somewhere else. And is that going to be a carbon producing source or not? I was going to just follow up on the ambassador's uh, point about uh, Yucca Mountain. It's uh, interesting. I've had the pleasure to be there four times. Uh, if you've been there, you say, boy, what, this is the perfect place on earth to store uh, nuclear waste. And then when you talk, uh, and I've lived the issue for 12 years to see how, how the change has gone in the body. When it started out, most of the bodies were against it. If you took a poll today, it would be very close and it might be in support of it. Nay County, where it's actually located, the commissioners there are supportive of it. So it was like a shock to spend billions of dollars over all these years of a period and then all of a sudden say that policy is not the right policy. And we understand it's political, and I guess my question to both of you, is it a dead issue? I don't think so. I'm the one who will argue that I don't think it's a dead issue. And I've, I've watched, and as I say, they started a process to look at how you would decommission it. They've stopped that process of, of looking at how you would decommission. That, to me, is a real signal. Obviously, it becomes more problematic if Harry Reid's reelected and he continues to lead the Senate. 
that's tough. I mean, it is a, it is a matter of, of blood with the delegation. But how long is the rest of the country going to let Nevada stop if this is what the country decides it needs to be a part of the overall mix, just a part of it, how long are they going to let Nevada stop it with all the money that's been put into it, with the fact that it is such a good site? And from the water perspective, we established the standard that the challenge was, did you make it a groundwater standard or a drinking water standard? We made it drinking water because that was tougher when I was at EPA. And it's supposed to be when this is where I think government makes really undermines public confidence when it calls for these kind of standards. A million years. You've got to be able to prove this is going to be safe for a million years. Uh, it was 10,000 years. Initially, we were taken to court, having established the 10,000 years, and the, so the EPA just wanted to okay, make it a million. But we felt that at the time, and I wasn't there when we did the million, but uh, that DOE could meet that, that Yucca Mountain could be proven to be safe and protect the water for 10,000 years, of course. You know, who knows? Who planet may have blown up? They're, the aliens are coming, as we've seen recently. We're talking to them, and they may not be friendly when they come. So they may take care of the issue. It's, it's kind of interesting when this, this issue of climate change has really been a game changer in this conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and the simple question that I, that I ask of uh, policymakers here now is if you truly believe climate change is a 100-year issue, why are you worried about solving a million-year issue? When you know part of the solution in the 100 year issue, we've got time to figure out the next one if it really, the issues of the urgency that you state. But there are a number of lawsuits playing out right now. In fact, we're party to one right now. We, we pay a mil per kilowatt hour usage fee right now. So for us, we pay the government $30 million a year. And for those regulated entities, ratepayers are paying that, that fee to the government on a continuing basis, which the Energy Secretary says he plans to continue to collect even though he has no solution, and as I said, Yucca Mountain is not one. So there are lawsuits in that area. There are lawsuits with NRC review of the license, and so this is an issue in the courts and the lawyers right now. Well, you might want to know that the uh, National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, sure. which the governor was uh, part of, uh, uh, it was an interesting winter meetings because they were really fired up, and everybody was in unison feeling you don't spend that kind of money and that kind of time without the government now. We appreciate the letter that uh, was sent there. Sorry. This takes us in a slightly different direction, but uh, from a national security standpoint, how scalable on a, on a global scale is nuclear power as a solution? Are we equally comfortable with Libya developing nuclear power as we are France? Well. Before you get into that, <laughs> okay. let me just say one thing. What is our biggest, two of our biggest international issues and concerns today? So nuclear Iran and nuclear Pakistan. We haven't brought new nuclear on to speak of since the 70s. They're going to go ahead and do what they're going to do, whether or not we bring on nuclear power. So the question becomes, should we really handicap ourselves, handcuff ourselves, and say we can't take advantage of this power because over there they might do something bad with nuclear power, which they're going to do no matter what we do, and we see that right away. It's a very real question and a very real concern to have, and as they scale down, and one of the things that, that Secretary Chu was talking about just yesterday, and putting more money into smaller nuclear, 50 to 100 megawatts, to locate, because you were talking about some smaller uh, facilities, energy generating facilities closer to towns. Closer to people. Yeah. Because of the, of the uh, transmission issues. They're talking about putting more money into that and developing smaller ones and moving them around. But I just, every time, I have gotten that question more than once. And my real reaction is what we do in this country vis-a-vis -vis nuclear energy is not going to impact what they do with nuclear for energy or for, or for weapons grade. But the international bodies are the ones that are going to have to oversee that, and that's problematic one way or the other, but yeah, that, we have that's a different a, take. Yeah, well, I'll give you just a little different perspective of that. We are, in fact, the, we produce more nuclear energy in this country than any other country in the world. We are, in fact, the leaders of the technology currently. What I worry about is we're giving that position away. We've already given it away in the manufacturing area, and our expertise in this, in standards that we operate to, I think, in, in time will could be given away here too. If you look at where plants are actually being built in the world, is that over 50, 
20 in China, about a dozen in Russia, a number in India behind that. And if we don't get a seat at the table and help to determine the rules by which we're going to operate in nuclear plants and the standards and have the right oversight bodies, those countries will decide for us. And, and, and I think uh, that makes the, you know, the likelihood that, we're, uh, that something bad could happen with nuclear materials greater. And uh, in a discussion with folks in Japan and France, they want to see the United States step up and take a leadership role here because uh, they don't want to see us re relent in that. And uh, I don't think anybody you know, wants the countries that you described uh, to be able you know, to determine to themselves how it is they use this stuff. With the state's take on uh, Oyster Creek and the Cold Showers, uh, is uh, PSCG bracing for the inevitable requirement to install Cold Showers? I, I don't know I'd say I'm bracing for it. We, we try to uh, show people, and, and this is a kind of an interesting uh, uh, issue, is how much does it cost to put in a cooling tower? And uh, you can answer, you, that answer can, can, can take two forms. If you ask a cooling tower manufacturer what it costs to build a cooling tower, he will tell you how much it costs to build a cooling tower. The problem with how much does it cost to install a cooling tower is a lot different than that. And uh, in fact, it is a very, very complex undertaking. The first piping systems that are put in the plant are the circulating water pipes. So essentially, you have to gut the plant to be able to get to this. You have to completely change out the condenser, the circulating water cooling system, and the like. It's a very, very complex engineering problem. So for the folks who try to simplify this and say that it's easy and it's not that expensive, I would like to guarantee them to guarantee me that they can do it for the prices that are being advertised. So what we are trying to do is trying to, once again, talk in facts. First of all, what, why do we think there is a need for this? And let's show the real impact on the estuary. And then deal with the complexities of, uh, of this change out. And then try to answer the question, so where do those other 80 megawatts come from now? And might there be other solutions here that, that, that can satisfy all parties? Yes, sir. Going back to the uranium sources, I don't know if you have read about it, but uh, our uh, friend uh, Chavez, which Ambassador uh, Hughes knows a lot about, and uh, Ahmadina Jam from Iran, they have developed these uranium ore mines in the Venezuelan Brazilian border, and every day at 747 leaves the airstrip that they built to Tehran with uranium ore. They picked it, it was picked up by Israeli satellite pictures. They were accused by, uh, actually, they were indicted by, uh, what's his name, District Attorney Murtaugh from New York, which was retiring in December. He, he denounced it at the Brookings Institution. So we worry here about transportation of Iran and Iran. They do it. Rock steps <coughs> through it. Iran's goal is to become a nuclear power. And they don't have to respond to anybody. They don't have <coughs> meetings like this. They just do it. Period. Good question on public opinion. Uh, we did some surveying just of South Jersey. Uh, I stopped in the youth center uh, with, the, with the assumption that if you live in southern New Jersey, you live within 100 miles of a nuclear plant, whether it's in Pennsylvania or wherever it might be, but you, you do. We found that people were more supportive the closer they live to nuclear plants. Are you seeing that nationally? Yeah, that's entirely consistent with all the national polls. It gets up to 75, 80 percent positive the closer you live because those people have seen the benefits of nuclear. Uh, they've seen what it's done for their community. They know how safe it is. And, and the polls that, uh, that actually Case commissioned a poll early on, and one of the things that they excluded was anybody who worked at the plant. Nobody who worked at the nuclear reactors was asked, was participated in this particular poll, and it found it was upward of 80 percent of the people who were said, "Yes, bring on another reactor here. We'd be we'd be comfortable with it," because, as I say, they've they've lived next to it, they've seen it, they know what it means for their community, they benefited from the power, from the reliability, and the cost once it was up and running. So that no, that's something we do see nationwide. Governor, you mentioned. Uh, you know, I was reading one figure. Uh, where of the 100, 304 operating plants, I guess 53 are seeking extensions mm -hmm. for the, their for the lifetime. Do you, do you think any of those should be shut down? Should should not get extensions? And for instance, Vermont Yankee, where there were problems there. I'm not a nuclear 
expert. I couldn't say what is right or wrong with the individual reactors, and uh, one of the things CASE doesn't do is get into that kind of lobbying. So I couldn't say whether they were right or wrong, but one of the things I do understand is that if we were to upgrade the reactors here in New Jersey, the current reactors, upgrade them, and be able to provide power for another million homes in the state, and this is one of the statistics that I saw recently. So there's a lot to be said if you can do it, but that's going to be up to the individual, the, the relicensing, it has to go through the NRC, and of course what the local utility regulators determine and the local population. Ed, if I could add something there, because uh, you read an awful lot that the NRC has never turned on a license renewal application. That's true. The other part of that is, is, as you said, there's 104 operating plants today. There have actually been over 140 operating licenses granted, which means there's a population of plants that haven't made it that far. And they didn't make it that far for a number of reasons. One is they weren't willing to upgrade your plants as, as, as new safety standards came out. Two is uh, maybe they, they could never operate them efficiently. And uh, they got out of the business. And, and so the fact that you can survive 40 years with the, the tough regulatory climate we have uh, should be no surprise you can survive 20 more because you built the infrastructure, trained your people, got the necessary programs and processes in place that you, you should be able to operate for 20 more. But I will tell you, a number of people have not made it that far. And, you, you know, and uh, that, that's in the 15 to 20 percent range. I'd like to pick up a little bit more on the public policy um, and public perception idea here you talked about. Um, how do we take the, um, the marketing and public relations associated with this um, to another level and take that 63% of the population to 75 or 80% and create a groundswell? And I guess specifically what I'm thinking is that we, um, you know, we need to take the points that you're making here and put them into bite-sized pieces that common people can understand and get behind and say, yeah, we should be doing that. Well, that's really what Case Energy is all about. That's why it was formed and what we do. And Patrick Moore and I go out, particularly in those areas where there is an appetite, at least amongst the utilities, to bring on more nuclear, to start talking to opinion leaders, to do op-eds. We do a lot of op-eds. We do a lot of... Uh, radio and television interviews, just giving out facts so that when the time comes for the utility to put in the, the permit application and things start to get real, the public has some facts um, to get their heads around and, and a framework within which to make the decision. And as we expand the numbers, we're up over about 2,500 now, both organizations, we have labor, a lot of labor union groups are, are part of it, utilities are part of it, health, some health groups as well as individuals. We have current and former elected officials, and the whole theory behind it is that there's strength in numbers. So that when people, whether it's a utility regulator or a utility president or a, an elected official who has to make a decision on this, they can look around and say, hey, they're thinking people behind me who think we ought to be looking at this. I'm not crazy. I'm not going to be hoisted and drawn and quartered and hung from the nearest tree if I start to talk about it. So we're trying to get that message out. CleanSafeEnergy.org, as I say, is the, is the website. We don't, nobody pays anything to be a member of CASE. It's just using your name. It's just having your name there. It's not, uh, nothing's asked of people. If they want to co-sign op-eds and things like that, that's great. But that whole, that, that's the whole theory behind it, is to get in, particularly into those communities where the likelihood of having more nuclear is getting more and more real, and start to educate the people there and get them into the discussion early on. I think the work that the, the governor has done, you know, co-chair in the organization has been very, very good from a national standpoint to get out just the points that, that you're talking about. That said, we have an obligation ourselves to make sure that we do the same thing on a local basis. And uh, one of the other big learnings that I had when we went overseas again is every new nuclear plant that was being built had an information center next to it that was being used to train and educate the public. So actually, our big first big investment in a new, new nuclear plant was we built an information center. In fact, it opened in January, and I'd welcome anybody to come down. And it is just uh, what the governor said is about facts. And it's not all nuclear stuff. In fact, I would tell you it's more about energy than it is about nuclear. But it is hopefully a discussion about what the energy facts are, lays out the various choices, and then at least provides the framework uh, for which uh, we make our choices, and then folks who leave you know, can make their own. But uh, it's interactive display. We've had several thousand people down here just since the beginning of the year. 
Anyone else? Can I make just a couple of comments? Go ahead. Does it, anybody think I'll down here? First of all, Ed, I'd like to make use of your time sharing up and down. Something exciting. This regards a, a comment that sometimes memory is the, the so I would say that one of the greatest flaws that people have in terms of government. There have been recent reviews about the future of Atlantic City. They base it upon the construction of a convention center, a great arena at the Boardwalk Hall, a tunnel, and the fact that we have a base of rooms in Atlantic City. That's the governor who did the tunnel, although it pulled four to one negative in the rest of the state of New Jersey. That's the governor who signed the bill in the mid-90s to increase the room stock. That's the governor who, after Governor Florio started, signed on for significant upgrades to make it a state-of-the-art convention center. That's also the governor who authorized the renovation of the boardwalk hall. And that's the senator things, that made it happen. <laughs> <laughs> was needling the governor constantly. <laughs> why did you? I was. I, this is the best I've ever been. Here. I, I know it I is. But like, I, well, I'm waiting you know, for you to but, explode. But, but in all fairness, <laughs> if you look at everything in terms of the future of this region, it's based upon those initiatives. And that's the governor, especially on the tunnel, who signed them, who did it. And there was an advisor in the room who said, why are you doing this? This poll, and we've seen recent polling data on doing anything for Atlantic City. If anybody talks about infrastructure, what happens? And um, it should be said, because if those things weren't in place today, uh, we wouldn't have the chances we have to turn the uh, corner on the economy. And I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So now, as we close, I'm going to ask the president of New Jersey's Green College to say that. <laughs> <laughs> first of all, please join me in thinking. <laughs> One of the things I think that's very important in a community, particularly in terms of an academic community and in a democracy, is in fact to get information out and foster intelligent discussion about it. And that's, I think, what we've done today. And in an environment where we need this, that's true. And in an environment where our democracy is, in fact, in question in terms of people listening to a reasonable debate and assessing arguments and listening to factual discussions of scientific and engineering. I'm very grateful to Ambassador Hughes for our having the Hughes Center here, which fosters these types of discussions today and on many other occasions. For Sharon Schulman, the Executive Director for her fine work. Bill Gormley, Senator Gormley, who really makes these events possible. Uh, on a lighter note, I'm also really pleased that the panel all got the email about coordinating their color scheme for the stock <laughs> 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 And more importantly than anything else, thank you for being here. Because the future of this region really depends on our coming together, thinking through these issues, and moving forward in an intelligent way. Thank you very much.